You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. Hello, world, and welcome to Tales from Hollywood Land, a variable feast of movies, Broadway, showbiz stories, news and gossip. With Julian Schlossberg, Arthur E. Friedman, and Stephen J. Rubin. Today we talk about directors Otto Predinger and John Sturgis. And now, here's Julian, Arthur, and Steve. Hey guys, uh, I was thinking about the topic, you know, we know who directors are today. It's kind of, uh, it's part of the part of the vocabulary but i remember growing up watching movies i never paid attention to credits whatsoever i just wanted to make sure they were over so the movie would start and directors came in all different sizes and varieties and personalities and demeanors and today i'm just excited that we're talking about two very legendary directors who are very different one was very low-key and I would say one was very high key. Yeah, <laughs> Mr. Preminger certainly would be there. And we're gonna, and since we're going to start with Otto Preminger, uh, we have to go immediately to Julian because Julian knows a lot about Otto Preminger. Well, I spent a lot of time with Otto because he was based in New York, and he, he was an extraordinarily interesting man, uh, notorious on the set where he was considered a tyrant and yelling at lots of actors. But if you look at the amount of famous actors that he directed, it's the biggest list probably or almost any director that I can think of of that period because you've got John Wayne and Kirk Douglas and Billy, I mean, uh, uh, Gary Cooper, I'll say Billy Mitchell, and and you know, George C. Scott and James Stewart, and it just goes on and on. Marilyn Monroe, Jane Fonda, he just directed the biggest and the best. Uh, not necessarily in great movies always, but he was a very interesting man. He was a man who was an attorney. He graduated as uh, at law school in the University of Vienna. And he also, as we all know, was a producer, an actor, and a director. I would say as a producer, there was probably not too many people better. And I say that because this is what all the studios felt about his producing he would almost always come in on budget. He, like John Ford, not that he, I compare them as far as directors, because Ford was probably one of the greats of all time. Otto was a damn good one. But he he believed in economy and shooting. So there were a lot of master shots. There wasn't a lot of coverage. He would always bring his movies in on budget or even under budget. Before I go, I don't want to go on too long about him, his background, but quickly... He was an attorney. His father was going to be the attorney general of Austria, but it was a Catholic country and he was a Jew and they wanted him, his father, to say to say he was a Catholic. His father wouldn't do it. And they said, "Okay." And then a week later, they gave him the job anyhow. So when you hear that kind of toughness in those days uh, for a Jew in an anti-Semitic country and he stood up, you can see where Otto got his strength. And we'll talk about that strength a little later. I'll send it over to you guys, and then I'll be back. Julian, can you tell what what picture did he do with Marilyn Monroe? River of No from No Ah, Return. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's one actually. It's one of my favorites, and he. I don't think he ever did a western before or again. And it's a very visceral western because you've got two, uh, shall we call them hunks? You've got Robert Mitchum, very being very hunkish. And then you've got Marilyn Monroe, was, which I don't think you call him or her a hunk, but those two were combustible together. And uh, I, I would have liked to have been little Tommy Reddick, you know, the boy from Lassie who was in that movie, because he got to spend a lot of time with Marilyn and, in fact, was the escort to the premiere of Marilyn Monroe. Oh, well, that was the only – see, that was not a dog that he took. That was the, <laughs> not a dog. Took. But he was known – he was known uh, for, as combustible as he was, he had a horrible reputation for being brutal on the set to his actors. He was also somebody who challenged the censor code probably more than any director. He, he was. He was by far. 
And he was, because I would dine with him, I would spend time with him, he was on my radio show, I went to his offices, Arthur, his offices was on the top floor of Columbia, 7-Eleven Fifth Avenue, I wonder if he was there when you were there, probably mm-hmm. not. I don't think so. No, but we would have lunches and dinners, and he had these incredible, you know, you don't think of Otto Preminger as blue eyes, but he had these incredible piercing blue eyes and what a raconteur that was fantastic and a charming man. He had that charm, the Viennese charm that you can have with that big, bold head of his. And very close to, of all people, Don Rickles. How about that combination? Well, they had the head in common, the bald head. Yes. Well, he loved, he loved, loved comedy and uh, he loved comedians. But... Um, did he uh, did he direct the, the Moon is Blue? He certainly did, yeah, and well, he had a, that was one of his first fights. They had the temerity to use the word virgin and seduced, and they wanted to ban it because of that. Can you imagine? Oh, That's boy. the kind of time we've lived in that those two words caused this sensation by uh, uh, by he using those, and that was the beginning of his fighting with the code. Steve mentioned it, and I'll go quickly. The man with the golden arm took on drugs that almost no one did, advising consent, homosexuality, uh, anatomy of a murder, they said semen. They said panties. Oh, my God. This was enough to really close down theaters. Our boy, Mayor Daly, in Chicago, got the movie condemned. Otto sued, went to Chicago, got it overturned, anatomy of a murder was opened. But he was a fighter for censorship. He was a fighter for everything. Julian, Julian, for those of us who have not seen The Moon is Blue, can you give us a quick thumbnail of what The Moon is Blue is about? I really can't, Steve. But thank you for asking. (laughs) (laughs) I I want to say this about Otto Preminger. Uh, He directed some great movies. He he did. Uh, But I remember him most for being the Nazi colonel or whatever it was in one of my favorite movies of all time, which was Stalag 17, he came on, he, he was in that movie for maybe five minutes, if that, but he was incredible. I mean, you know, as, as an actor, he was perfect. Uh, he, he, the, the he really, going, and, and, and Steve mentioned about directors at the beginning, Arthur, and the truth is that we grew up only knowing one or two directors, and he was one or two that we knew. We knew Hitchcock. And we knew him. We didn't know the rest of the. We didn't know what, what David Lean. We didn't know who these people were. But we knew them. And and Hitchcock, of course, like Preminger, were self promoters. They knew that could help their career. I mean, can you imagine that Otto Preminger is Mister Freeze on Batman? Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's really something. Apparently, uh, according to IMDb, he actually asked for that role. He went to the producers. And they, he got the role. I think he replaced someone. But there he was did. something to deal with he SAG did. that he had to renew past uh, his past dues for his SAG membership. So it cost him much more to <laughs> be in that film than he made in that film. It actually was out of pocket. I Otto think- Preminger directed a movie called Laura, which is one of the great movies of all time, that has perhaps arguably the greatest song of all time from a movie. And that was Laura. <clears throat> written by a writer named David, composer named David Raxon. Raskin. And yeah. uh, that song has lasted forever, recorded by every good artist. Uh, great movie. Well, well, that was a Fox movie, and Zanuck ran Fox, and Zanuck and Preminger did not like each other at all. What it, it, it all came about because the great book Robert Louis Stevenson wrote, Kidnapped, Zanuck himself had adapted it for the screen. And Otto and he, uh, Otto was directing it, and they would fight like crazy. And Otto walked off and walked away. Zanuck then gets going to, goes into World War II, into the Army, and a guy named Bill Getz takes over the studio and hires Otto to do a seven-year contract for Fox. Mm. And so Otto is developing Laura. He can't wait to do Laura. That's going to be his film that's going to break him out. And Zanuck comes back and says, I don't like you. I never liked you. You can produce it. You can't direct it. I'm hiring Ruben Mamoulian. So Ruben Mamoulian comes on, Laura, and starts shooting it. And he has Lad Krieger, 
this big hulking villain to play the villain. There's nothing subtle about it. The audience would know immediately. He had made a movie called The Lodger that everybody knew at that time, and it was very famous. So they had this fight, Mamoulian and Preminger, and Zanuck, Mamoulian, and Preminger then watch the Russia's Zanuck says to Preminger, fire him, you're taking over. And Preminger starts from the beginning, throws out all the footage, and the original picture, this is kind of funny, the original picture of Laura that it was in the Mamoulian version was painted by Mamoulian's wife. They even got rid of that. <laughs> <laughs> so they started all over again. Jennifer Jones turned down the role. She was asked to do it. And he, uh, he, Preminger, having spent many years on the New York stage as a director, wanted Clifton Webb. Zanuck didn't want him at all. He thought he was too effeminate. And so Clifton Webb was in L.A. doing Blythe Spirit on the stage. And Preminger got him to come in, and they did a screen test. And Zanuck said, you're right, hire Clifton Webb. So Waldo Lidecker, what a name. <laughs> And, and he must have made quite a splash because he was in a lot of classic 20th century Fox films after that. That's like he right. Did those wonderful Mr. Belvedere movies. Mm. And then, she, of course, he's in the first, the first Titanic opposite yeah. Barbara Stanwyck. And uh, just a wonderful actor. Uh, probably had to hide, a, hide the fact for many years that he was gay in a Hollywood that would not tolerate people openly gay. It's true. Apropos well, of today and what, what is going on, or has been for some time, but uh, Otto Preminger directed a movie called Exodus, uh, which uh, w was marketed in those days when that movie opened. Everybody knew about that movie. Uh, it was well, never a huge bestseller. A huge bestseller by me on yeah. yours. Yeah, yeah. Never as great a movie as it maybe could have been, but uh, did business and uh, pretty good movie. Uh, Otto well, it was has one, he has one distinctive thing that, it, once again, Otto's strength. He broke the Hollywood blacklist. He hired Dalton Trumbo, yes. put his name on the screen. I mean, he was really courageous. He really fought him tooth and nail and, uh, and won not much of the time. Kind of came in about the same time that Kirk Douglas insisted that Dalton get a credit on Spartacus. So they were about the same period. I, b I believe he was first. I think you. I think you're right. You're absolutely. He made a little. Right. He made a little movie called "The Man with a Golden Arm." Did that ever get uh, uh, noticed from everybody about taking on drugs and stuff? And had this small theme that was that went like this: da 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 da, and it was all it was drum. And Sinatra used that any time that Sinatra would open in those days. That's how they'd bring him on with that 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 that, that, that great little you know. Uh, yeah, from the movie. There was da, also da, 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 da. What great stuff! Um, it was, yeah. and it was a big. Actually, the instrumental was a big success uh, as a record. And our contest oh. this week in that movie, "The Man with the Golden Arm," guys, is Kim Novak was in it, of course. What was her name in the movie? I, I have no idea. I have no idea either. Molly, come on, guys. Oh, right. Molly with those green eyes. That she, was the <laughs> she'd, lay on top of, she'd lay on top of Sinatra because he, he was so cold from trying to break the habit. And Molly, oh, Molly, you know, hey, Molly. Well, both oh. of you guys have broken into song tonight. You know, I'm very jealous. I am a closeted singer. And I'm just and very jealous. We, we, Steve, we appreciate that you're in the closet. <laughs> <laughs> now, one of the things I've, I noticed about uh, a lot of... Um, Otto's films in the 60s is he worked very closely with a genius who did did titles named Saul Bass yes. and and Otto's it's the first time I really noticed the the logo for his movies was very very you know very well thought out I noticed it for Exodus you know the that the, the, the lines people people their hands up in the air and then he did another um great logo for in harm's way which is probably the one of the first auto preminger films i ever saw after exodus and uh, that's uh, that movie has become a bit of a cult following although it did not do well originally but it was an epic 
And like Exodus, Otto seemed to be comfortable commanding an army of people. So in a way, he had that DeMille, James Cameron quality. Well, we should like also mention, since, since you went with Saul Bass, and Arthur mentioned the man with the golden arm, that arm that comes down was the Ed. Yeah. A black arm was the man with the golden arm. And an anatomy of a murder, if you remember, it's kind of like little footsteps almost. Yeah. But, you know, because of his background as a lawyer, because of his father's background as a prosecutor, he was drawn to a lot of those films like Anatomy of a Murder, courtroom films, the court of the, uh, the B- Billy Mitchell, the court, you know, of Billy Mitchell, um, uh, and also St. Joan. He he liked courtroom. And the, the, the American Bar Association considers Anatomy of a Murder one of the four or five greatest movies ever made on a courtroom. What a cast in that movie. James Stewart, I believe his best role ever, ever, that he ever did. Lee Remick, who was not the original. The original was Lana Turner. And supposedly they quit. She quit or he fired her over costumes, supposedly. And so Lee Remick, you've got James Stewart, you've got Ben Gazzara, and you've got a lean and mean and tough George C. Scott. Well, it's one hell of a cast. He did. He did. And Murray Hamilton was in that movie. And Arthur O'Connell was in that movie. Arthur, I loved Eve, Arthur O'Connell. And Eve Arden was Eve Arden was in that movie. There was a, she was great. There was a great little scene where they're eating hard boiled eggs at a stand. Uh, Arthur O'Connell and uh, and uh, Stewart. And Arthur O'Connell's pouring salt on his egg, and he the, he poured it on for like a minute and a half. <laughs> I've never seen anything like that. I wanted to say about Otto Preminger. These two movies, Advised and Consent. And Anatomy of a, of a Murder are on no top 100 lists, incredibly. In my opinion, they're on my top 25 list. These are two of the great little great movies ever, both black and white. Uh, outstanding, outstanding movies. Um, you know, another thing that came up, I looked through the list the other day, the AFI top 100 list. Guys, would you believe that Dr. Zhivago is not on the top 100 list? How about yeah. that? That's crazy. Well, These list makers, you know, I, I don't, I, I, I quibble with them constantly. I mean, they're, they're, you know, uh, the, the, well, the, the missing films are just enormous. And then again, all the bodies that make their lists, even the Academy Awards, the way they nominate films is incredible. It's incredible. You, Steven, singing, you know, singing in, <laughs> singing in the rain in any, in any world, not only is nominated for best picture, but it wins for Best Picture, and, and a thousand out of a thousand. And not only did they nominate Cecil B. DeMille's rather pedestrian greatest show on earth, that won Best Picture that year. In what universe? <laughs> you know, it has nothing to do with the subject, but it's worth telling this fast story about this, the list kind of thing. A dear friend of mine was a guy named Bert Boyer. Bert wrote uh, with his wife, Jane, Yes, I Can, which was the biography of, uh, of Sammy Davis Jr. Uh, not arguably, inarguably one of the greatest talents of all time. So Bert, Bert was very close to Sammy, and uh, he picks up a, a, a BET list. Of, no, it was Ebony, a list of the top 100 black entertainers from Ebony. And he turns to page, where well, Sammy will be number one for sure. And he turns to page one, and it's Michael Jackson. He says, well, I understand. It goes to page two, it's James Brown. Goes to page three. Long story short, Sammy's not on the list of the oh. top 100 great black entertainers. So he calls oh up goodness. Bob Johnson, of, of uh, who owned Ebony, and said, Bob, how can this be? He says, I can't believe it. So he called him back. He said, most of the people who chose that list were like 25 years old. And he, he apologized all over the place and said he would do a special issue on Sammy. But that's what goes to show you what happens with lists. How could Dr. Zhivago not be on the top 100 list, guys? It's impossible. Certain things about movies that if, if it's a great movie score, the soundtrack, that sticks with me sometimes longer than the movie. In fact, when I first started to collect record soundtracks, one of the first albums I ever caught was Exodus, which we talked about. Uh, but he also did a movie featuring the music of Jerome Moras, one of my favorite composers, called The Cardinal which was Love one it. of Otto's big bombs. It, I don't think it did any business. Great theme. 
great theme, and that's Moross. And uh, the star of of the Cardinal was a very strapping young man named Tom Tryon, who later became a novelist. But apparently, Otto was brutal towards him, just brutal. Why he agreed to come back and take a part in an harm's way, I have no idea. I don't think Tom knew why he took the part. But apparently, he was, was once again treated so badly. I mean, Otto apparently in front of the whole crew would start yelling at uh, Tom if he forgot a line and just berating him and humiliating him. So much so that Tom left the business after that movie and gave up his acting career to become a successful novelist. But Tom Tryon, I don't know if you know Tom Tryon. Tom Tryon was the most one of the most handsome men in Hollywood, almost like a Warren Beatty type. He did a film, a Western uh, called The Glory Guys, which was originally going to be all about Custer's Last Stand, but they ran into a conflict. They had to change the, the uh, title of it and the names of all the characters because of a conflict with another movie. But I like Tom a lot. It's unfortunate that Otto's brutality just threw him out of the business. Always confused Tom Tryon with John Gavin. He did write a bestseller called The Other, which eventually made into a movie and which I launched in New York City. It was an interesting film. One of the few films Uta Hagen was in, the great oh. acting teacher. But back, back to uh, Otto, um, he, the probably the most famous European director at that time when he was growing up, was Max Reinhardt. Max Reinhardt, who had come over to America and had made a, uh, a couple of films, but mostly he was known for theater. And that's how Otto got involved with theater as an actor and as a director uh, with Reinhardt. And on the Cardinal, going back to the Cardinal, believe it or not, Arthur and Steve and Mike, he was nominated for the Academy Award for the director of the Cardinal. I happen to like the movie. Uh, liked it when I first saw it. Liked it to seeing it many years beyond that. Uh, again, I say that Tom Tryon was always confusing to be confused with John Gavin. They had the same kind of a, of yeah, a look. Yeah, same uh, type. One sure. of the, 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 that theme in, that, in, in the film was outstanding. And as a matter of fact, they put a lyric to it and Sinatra recorded it because of the, of the, uh, of the, uh, the, the music, the melody. Uh, one of the nicest scenes in that movie takes place between John Huston, who plays the Cardinal, and Burgess Meredith, who's a priest in uh, some small town in New England, and Burgess Meredith is dying. Uh, one of the great, great actors that ever lived is Bert Met Burgess Meredith. What a career he had. Uh, but that's an underrated movie to me. I always liked the film. Uh, then again, I like Shoes of a Fisherman. I kind of like that kind of a story. Uh, by the way, the Cardinal I just looked up was profitable. It, it made money. Uh, oh, it did. Oh, that's good. Well, you know, it was, I think, uh, like in harm's way, like Exodus, weren't those all roadshow, originally roadshow releases? Exodus was. Harm's yeah. way. I don't know. Steve, did you like harm's way? I, I have grown to really love it over the years. It's a movie with tremendous flaws, has some of the worst mi World War II miniature work I've ever seen, lifeless <laughs> miniatures. It, that's one movie you could go into a digital redo and just turn the battle sequences at the end into something really powerful. It's kind of sad because by 1965, Hollywood miniature work was there, there were exemplary versions of of movies with miniature work that I just loved. I mean, Sink the Bismarck was six years earlier. If you look at their their ship miniatures, they're off the charts. Terrific. They were done, I believe, by the Lidecker brothers. Uh, who were well known for doing miniature work. It, the problem with the miniatures on In Harm's Way is they were so large, uh, they were actually controlled by human beings in the hull of the boat with a little slit to see things, which is, shows you how big they were. And they're lifeless. There's nothing going on on deck. They look like big miniatures, which is t terrible. Yeah. We, we talked about the breakthrough that this man did for so many films and so many ideals. But we should mention that he directed two all black musicals, mm. one being Carmen Jones and the second Porgy and Bess. Uh, he was a very courageous director and tried his hand in almost anything. As you guys pointed out, the Western he did with, with Marilyn and Bob Mitchum, but his brutality got a little too tough 
on a movie called Angel Face. It was Robert Mitchum and Gene Simmons, and in the scene, Mitchum has to slap Gene Simmons across the face. And they do it once, or twice, or three, or four, and at the fifth time when he did it, Mitchum slapped Preminger across the face. <laughs> Knocked him down. Oh. So, Good for Bob Mitchum. Sometimes the bully can get uh, busted. But the know. bonus, the bonus, the bonus for uh, for Preminger and Carmen Jones was he got to sleep with Dorothy Dandridge for four years. Uh, they had a long romance. Oh boy, a long romance. Yeah. But he uh, he was married three times, and he was. Uh, when I went to dinner with him the last time I saw him, uh, we went to dinner in New York City, and he told me a rather interesting story on the way over, and we had our lunch and on the way back he told me the same story and i realized that was the beginning of dementia that mm. he would do that because his he had a hell of a mind i mean it was real smart yeah and for him do, you re- do you remember the story julian i don't i don't not any more than i remember moon is blue <laughs> <laughs> in, in fact i might be in my early stages i hope not <laughs> anyhow um do we all agree that Advising Consent is one of the great movies? It was Nothing a about of any movie. Cer- certainly one of the best political movies. Charles and one, of, and one of his best movies, yeah. I would say, for me, his best movie was Anatomy of a Murder. For me, I, I thought that was the best. And I love Laura. Those, they would be my two favorites of Otto's films. Um, but okay, but just, he, just for the record, just so you know, and I'll... I'll just read what IMDb plays says. IMDb says about the moon is blue. Two aging playboys are both after the same attractive young woman, but she fends them off by claiming that she plans to remain a virgin until her wedding night. Ah. Both, both men determined to find a way around her objections. Yes, so thank, there it was. Thank you, thank you. I think it was. Uh... Dave, was David Niven and Maggie McNamara, was that the uh, two? I'm not sure. I think, I'm not sure. Will, was Bill Holden in Bill that? Bill Holden. Yeah. Yeah, it was Holden. Bill Holden, David Niven, and Maggie McNamara. Hey, okay. I saw I made a comeback. <laughs> you you not only made a comeback, you get the Cupid doll. Oh, well, I, I married her, so I'm lucky. All right. <laughs> well, I agree. I wanted to, wanted to say I agree with Laura. I certainly agree with uh, with. Uh, anatomy of a murder but you have to put advisory consent in there it's a it's a oh. jewel you know? I, I i would definitely agree with you i would too no. yep one yep. of his more mysterious movies i saw was one of his latter films was something called bunny lake is missing yeah um, which i remember seeing in yeah. in the uh late 60s uh, i may have been early 70s and it was uh a rather Unusual film for me to go. I never went to what I called art films. I was a kind of a mainstream guy. And this, uh, my friend Danny from high school always insisted that we see something different. And he was Mr. Art Film. And we went to see Bunny Lake is Missing. And that's a that's a pretty unusual picture. Was that Carol Lindley? Carol Lindley is in it. And Lawrence Olivier is in it. One of his uh, movies. He plays the inspector because Carol has lost her baby. Well, so she right. thinks. That's yeah. right, little bunny. That's absolutely yeah. true. And just, so, yeah. So let let us transition to for what I consider to be one of the great action film directors of all time, a guy who I got to know uh, through a very long interview, Mr. John Sturgis, and I think Julian, you brought him up first as a possible subject for one of our podcasts. I'm curious what motivated you. A bad day at Black Rock. Uh, I had an interesting, at least I thought it was an interesting story. I wanted to remake Bad Day at Black Rock. I generally wouldn't want to remake anything as a producer, but I had become friendly with Peter Falk, and I thought he was at the height of his game with Columbo, and I thought Peter Falk could play this role that Spencer Tracy played. I could see him as this kind of guy coming in with his obsession to find out where this Japanese man is. And uh, went to MGM, and MGM said, oh, great, 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 and eventually said no. But <laughs> that's a, making a long story short. But the movie, by the way, 81 minutes, guys. That's it. It's 81 minutes, and yet you had a full meal 
there was no question, 81 minutes, one of the shortest successful movies probably ever, as far as quality is concerned. And one of the greatest, uh, one did, of the greatest scenes think in it, your movies. Yeah, I don't think it, it did business, though. I don't uh, think it did. Uh, I don't think it did. did. Well, we'll check that no. out. But yeah. that scene when he gets into, in the bar with it and he, he beats up Ernest Borgnine, uh, right. that is a scene. Uh, you know, that scene lasted about 10 minutes. It was a great, great scene. Well, Sturgis was, an, Sturgis was an interesting man because, like Robert Wise, and they were very good friends, they started out together as editors, both of them. Right were editors, and uh, they uh, both became, I think, terrific directors. But I think a lot of people uh, have become uh, directors from editing, and and Sturgis uh, was one of the ones who, I guess, probably more than any director that I, when I was growing up, did more top Westerns than anyone. Is that right, Steve? He did. He did. His Westerns are true classics. And I will go back to what I said about him, about being an action director. You know, some directors just don't do action very well. In fact, they actually hand the megaphone or whatever they their voice over to their second uh, their second unit director or their you know action coordinator, and they sit back. Sturgis got into it. I think that everyone remembers John Sturgis from The Magnificent Seven, and it's it, it's it, Sturgis later admitted that one of the highlights of his life was meeting Akira Kurosawa who actually told him how much he loved The Magnificent Seven. And Sturgis just beamed about that because he considered Kurosawa just a legend. And to remake The Seven Samurai uh, was considered, you know, uh, by some people blasphemous. But uh, to be honest, I've watched The Seven Samurai. And I know that it's respected as one of the great films of all time. I find it very slow. <laughs> you and I, I, like I, Citizen I, Kane? I, I, I thought it was terrific, but I haven't seen it since college, oh. so I might find it very slow since that was a, right after the Civil War. First <laughs> off, uh, what did, uh, yeah. Arthur, what did you say about Citizen Kane? I said, were you, you also the guy that the first time you saw Citizen Kane, you didn't think it was that great? Well, I still feel that the first half is legendary and the second half is repetitive, but that's just me. And everybody's entitled to their opinion, including yeah. those people who make up those stupid lists. Where we got all lists, right? Yeah. <laughs> just a quickie, a quickie, Julian. Uh, the budget for the for Bad Day at Black Rock was one million two hundred eighty-eight thousand uh, dollars. Its gross was three million seven eight eight, just in domestic. So therefore, it uh, made made a lot of money between foreign and, and ancillary rights and what have you. So it was profitable picture. You know, John Erickson was in that movie. Uh, I, some, John Erickson was a very good-looking guy who never made stardom. They tried, they tried with him, but he was, he was one of the people in that movie. And I got to meet his daughter several times. She was gorgeous. She looked just like John Erickson. Uh, <laughs> Nicole, her name was Nicole Erickson. Uh, and, uh, I mean, you looked at her. You looked at this guy's face. But he was a, a, a star of that. Of those days, he would have been a star, but never became a star. Just one of those things. Like a guy named oh. Stuart Whitman. What was it? Stu Whitman, maybe? Same oh, thing. Yeah. Stuart, Stuart Whitman was bigger than John Erickson. Anyhow. Yeah, but still <laughs> not not major star. Not Rock oh. Hudson, you know, and all that kind of stuff. No. Look, no. look at the look at the cast of characters in The Bad Day at Black Rock. You got Robert Ryan, of course, all supporting Spencer Tracy. You've got Anne Francis, you've got Dean Jagger, you've got Walter Brennan, you've got John Erickson, we've got Ernest Borgnine, you've got Lee Marvin. I mean, one thing about Sturgis, and we we really, really did a lot of research on his career because he's featured in one of my books, is that he had a particular knack for casting. And every character in his movies is not just added to the cast. They're very carefully cast. And although you could say that everybody carefully cast their movie, but it just that Sturgis had a way of picking actors who were just perfect for their role and they stood the taste, the test of time. N nowhere is this more evident than for me, his masterwork. And the reason I approached him to do an interview back in 1974, which is The Great Escape. The Great Escape is my is my desert island movie. If I'm allowed to take one movie to a desert island and I can play it for the rest of time, it'll be The Great Escape. Well, that's what you'll probably be trying to do on that island. <laughs> but Buddy Hackett once said that if he was on a desert island and the only person with him was Beatrice Arthur, he would have headed for a tree. 
<laughs> so I knew you were going to say that. You always you, bring up that that Buddy Hackett line. <laughs> why not? Why not? But great Steve, Escape is one of the greatest movies ever made. Period. But Steve, it's important because I don't think any of us, but you, ever met Sturgis. Tell us about him. What kind of a guy was he? What? How did you find working, talking to him, and learning from him? Well, he um, not only did I interview him at Warner Brothers in 1974, but he actually annotated my chapter on The Great Escape in my book, uh, which was called Combat Films, American Realism, 1945 to 1970. And although in retrospect, The Great Escape isn't technically a combat film, it does for uh, it is a bit of war between the prisoners, of course, and their jailers in a in a in a in a German prisoner of war camp. He was terrific. I think that I got him at a time when he, I arrived at his office and I, uh, prominently on his desk was a book called The Boat, which later became a German movie called Das Boot. And I think I read that before it became the German movie uh, directed by that famous director, Wolfgang Peterson, I believe. That's his name. Yeah, that's his name. Um he uh, that was being groomed as a possible American film with, of all people, Robert Redford playing the sub commander. I'm so glad that didn't happen. That would have. Well, at least he had the blonde hair. <laughs> but Americans as as Germans don't really work too well, even though the movie was pretty good. I just couldn't accept Tom Cruise as von Stauffenberg in that the movie a few years ago about the assassination attempt. Uh, in any case, uh, Val, so he had the book Val on his Cruise. desk. Valkyrie. Valkyrie, exactly. Great one word title. Um, but I walked into his office having seen The Great Escape by then about 40 times. So I knew it pretty well. And we spent over three hours together talking about the making of that film. He was very proud of that. But he told me that it was a movie that was very difficult to get made. He acquired the rights to the original Paul Brickhill book about this mass escape from Stalaglyph 3. I think around 1952 or 53, it took him 10 years to convince the Marish brothers to finance the movie. Now, here we are in 2023, where movies can cost as much as 275 million for one movie or 300 million. And the budget cost for The Great Escape, drum roll please, was $4 million. $4 million bar- barely buys you craft service today on some of these epics. But but well, in all fairness, $4 million was probably a lot of money at that time. That's right. Exactly. And today, and over the past uh, several days, the Dodgers just signed Shoei Otani for $700 million. <laughs> and thank you very much. So things have changed, to say the least. So I, I started to interview him. And, and it's, it's a great story. Now, he had he had done a great deal of, uh, I mean, not only had the movie done a lot of business, but The Magnificent Seven really put him on a different plane altogether. And um, he told me that if the Marish brothers had asked him to direct the telephone book, uh, they they would have given, I mean, if he had asked to direct the telephone book, the Marish brothers would have given him a shot at that time, because he was the fair haired boy in Hollywood, although it wasn't exactly the first movie he did after the uh, Magnificent Seven, he did something called A Girl Called Tamiko, which kind of bombed. But fortunately, he decided with The Great Escape, as I was saying earlier, with his ability to put cast together, he took Steve McQueen, Charles Bronson, and James Coburn, all who had prominent roles in The Magnificent Seven, and put them in The Great Escape. And then he wanted Richard Harris to play Big X, but Richard Harris was not available. So he got an actor that, you know, was respected in England, but unknown in the U.S. named Richard Attenborough. And Richard Attenborough was terrific. He brought in David McCallum, who was very popular uh, shortly after uh, for The Man from Uncle as Ilya Kuryakin. Uh, and then just wonderful actors, uh, just wonderful actors. And The Great Escape was originally going to be filmed in California, but something was gnawing at Sturgis as to the real the reality of shooting it and where it took place. So he sent Robert Relier, who was his assistant, who had been his assistant on The Magnificent Seven, to Bavaria. And they just, and Relier wrote back that this is 
this is where you need to shoot it. So they went over there in 1962. How do you get along with Steve McQueen? Uh, <laughs> well, by 1962, Steve McQueen, who had, by the way, not only done The Magnificent Seven for John Sturgis, but had also done Never So Few. And the reason he got the role as Bill Ringa in Never So Few, which is another World War II movie, was that Frank Sinatra, the star, had gotten into a bit of a tiff with Sammy Davis Jr. Sammy Davis Jr. was going to play Bill Ringa, the American driver in Never Say, Never So Few. So McQueen got that role and stole the picture completely from Sinatra. And so he got into Mag Magnificent Seven. And then uh, he got to The Great Escape. But McQueen comes to set and he sees that all of the characters have parts in the escape. James Garner is the scrounger. Uh, Charles Bronson is the tunneler. David McCallum is in charge of dispersal. All the guys have their various role. All Steve McQueen does is bounce a ball in the jail, also known as the cooler. So McQueen started to squawk about that and refused to work until they changed the script. So Sturgis being Sturgis by then said, no effing way. Uh, and Steve McQueen sat out for six weeks and would not work. And as the story goes, as Robert Relier confirmed for me, Steve McQueen was fired. Now, there was some talk at that time that McQueen had his eyes on being a part of the British racing team as a professional sports car driver. And there was some thought that he was thinking about that. But what happened was as soon as Sturgis fired McQueen, cables were sent back to Los Angeles and the agent came out and they worked out a deal that writers would be brought out to make a little bit more business for Steve McQueen. So it's not just him bouncing baseballs in the cooler. And what happened is they came up with this idea of a scene where Steve would escape in that little wire maneuver of his and he would go out and make maps. And then he would purposefully get recaptured so he could tell the other people in the escape crew, particularly Richard Attenborough, what exists beyond the wall so they could get to the train station. And that seemed to satisfy Steve, and he came back to work. And the motorcycle but scene the, made the movie. Are you kidding? One of the great action sequences of all time was kind of worked iconic. out. In, uh, it's iconic. And there was always a thought to do it. In the script, I think it says Steve is chased on motorcycle or Hiltz is chased on motorcycle. And they worked it out really minutely. I got to know um, Bud Eakins very well. Bud Eakins was a good friend of Steve's. Bud Eakins had a motorcycle shop in Sherman Oaks. And he uh, McQueen would go in there to talk motorcycles. And, and then eventually McQueen asked him to be a stunt double. So the big scene in The Great Escape where Steve powers the motorcycle over the fence, and as you say, an iconic moment, was actually uh, Bud Eakins doing it. And then when Steve is machine gun and it gets sh uh, shot up in, uh, into the wire, that's also Bud Eakins. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, Steve, did, did uh, Sturgis start Le Mans and then get fired or quit, or was that with McQueen? What? What happened uh, with that? Absolutely. I think Sturgis came on to, uh, to, to start Le Mans, which was a big auto racing movie that Steve had envisioned because Steve was all about cars and racing. It was a natural for him. But McQueen by then was insufferable. He just would not listen to Sturgis. Sadly, uh, Sturgis made his career and he walked away. He just walked off the project. And as uh, today, Le Mans is kind of an oddity. It's a movie with, you know, it has great racing footage, but there's real no, there's no real narrative story to it, to, per se, that I could fathom. Two of the greatest uh, movie stars uh, happen to be Charles Bronson, who was in, of course, Great Escape, and Lee Marvin. Two, these two guys schlepped around from the end of World War II and schlepped for like, 17 years until they became stars. Uh, you would say Bronson probably really not until uh, Death Wish, I would think, Steve? Well, no, no. I think I think Charles Bronson... Um, as a star. As a star, I would say... Well, you're probably... Well, let's see. Like, The Great Escape is 63. He's not a star in that. He's part of the ensemble in Battle of the Bulge in 65. Yeah, you're probably right, Arthur. And Lee Marvin was probably Cat Ballou. 
definitely Cat Ballou really. Well, up until been, then was how many years? Cat Ballou then was 65 or 66. Or something. Well, I would argue that he also did. Uh, was it was the professionals before Cat Ballou? I think it was. Uh, 65 thereabouts. I'm not sure. 65, 65. Six, Yeah, around that. Yeah. I mean, um, it's interesting. I'm trying to think of, well, Lee Marvin. Did I say Lee Marvin was in Bad Day of Black Rock? Was that? Was we, that we, did, was? we did mention it. Yeah. Yeah. A small part. Yeah. Hey, how big a part did he have in uh, in professionals? He was one of them. He's the lead with Burt Lancaster. He, yeah, that was supposed to be. Whoa, 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 whoa. Burt Lancaster the lead. Was, and Robert Ryan. Yeah. And, and Robert Ryan. <laughs> Robert Ryan, Woody Strode, Claudia Cardinale in all her glory. F- um, FYI on sure. Great Escape, the movie cost $4 million. It grows domestic 11.7, which is a big hit in those days. And then there was foreign, and then there was ancillary, and where the Great Escape is a big, big money maker. Uh, oh yeah, no, and I think it launched Steve McQueen in, in a crazy fashion. I think Steve became a big star from that, and and Sturgis was responsible. His his um his staging of action, going back to the Magnificent Seven, uh, if you watch those action sequences, they're just they're like ballet. You know, they remade the Magnificent Seven recently. And it was so bad, it played like a video game. And I just, <laughs> it's like, you know, the guy. every time anybody fired a gun, somebody went down. Nobody ever misses in this remake. Um, <laughs> but talk about great musical themes. It doesn't get better than Magnificent Seven. Elmer Bernstein? Elmer Bernstein, who also did the theme for The Great Escape. The Great Escape theme, by the way, one of the great themes of all time, yeah. wasn't nominated at all. The, the Great Escape got one nomination for editor, that was the it. theme. wasn't wasn't not was that Jerry Goldsmith? Wasn't that was not that was no no the the, the great escape theme was Elmer Bernstein. Mm-hmm. wasn't nominated. the big The big music that year was Tom Jones. Oh. Tom Jones like swept the Oscars for yeah. all the technical qualities. Yeah, big, now big. interestingly, after the Great Escape, Sturgis's career never really reached the levels of the success of that movie. He he made some movies that really bombed badly. And we were talking Westerns earlier, although he did great Westerns. We, we have forgotten to mention one of his other great Westerns, mm-hmm. which also had Burt Lancaster in it with the Kirk Gunfight. Gunfight. Gunfight at the, at the OK, OK Corral. Absolutely. And uh, he actually uh, did another version of the OK Corral, kind of a post-OK Corral called Hour of the Gun with James Garner. Mm. And, um, we had that at United Lowe. Artists, and uh, that did not work, nor did Hallelujah Trail. That was a huge bomb. Wow. So, by the way, in Sturgis's office at Warner's that day, he said the best script he'd ever read, ever, was the script, the original script for Never So Few. For those listeners who don't know the movie, this takes place in Burma in 1943 and involves the irregular efforts of a unit headed by Frank Sinatra to fight the Japanese behind the lines, based, I believe, on a, Oz, a Robert a, a Charles Osborne novel. So a great, it, a great script. The greatest script you ever read turned out to be a bad movie. Well, the Never, Never Say Few is not a bad movie, but the studio wanted to add something for the female audiences. So all of a sudden, Gina Lola Brigida <laughs> is in Never <laughs> Say Few. Why not? Just, <laughs> I would argue that's not only for the women, but the guys weren't too upset. About that. <laughs> So it's, ever uh, see, ever hey, see listen, Gino Sturgis, Sturgis also made Joe Kidd did well. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he did, he did, but most how, how of did his, how did that John Wayne do? Arthur and Steve McHugh was that it called? I think he did that too, didn't he? He did, he did, and I think it did okay. Arthur's our our, our expert on box office. I'll get folks. back to you. I'll well, you know, it is interesting that both Sturgis and Preminger end up as two directors that made some great movies but their last movies were nowhere just nowhere by and large well he made um you know space movies uh were becoming very popular especially especially big studio space movies and that that was the era of 2001 a space odyssey from kubrick but john sturgis did a kind of a stillborn movie called marooned which I did not think was very good, although Never. again, very well cast. John. Oh yeah, I think Gregory Peck. I think was Gregory in that. Peck, David yeah. Jansen. Uh, uh, just a, I a, think I think I launched the Ziegfeld Theater with Marooned, and we were Marooned <laughs> <laughs> in New York. But 
Now, it's interesting that so mu- very few top directors go out on top. If you look at the biggest, greatest directors, by and large, their last movies are not very good. The only one I can think of is the John Huston, whose last two movies were Prizzy's Honor and The Dead. Now, Prizzy's Honor was a hit. The Dead was not, but it's a brilliant movie, but an art movie. But he directed those on his back in oxygen, uh, on his back on a stretcher with the, uh, with the uh, monitor. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, interestingly enough, even though I mentioned a lot of John uh, Sturgis's post Great Escape movies didn't do very well, the last movie he's credited with directing is did did pretty well. It's called The Eagle Has Landed. I liked yeah. it. I mean, yeah, it was a good movie. Uh, again, very interesting cast of all things. Donald Pleasance, who, as you recall, played the forger that goes blind in The Great Escape, just a wonderful part for Donald. He's uh, Sturgis cast him as Himmler. In the Eagle Has Landed, which I thought was quite quite interesting casting, but Michael Michael Caine is just wonderful in um, in the Eagle Has Landed, uh, and the movie itself is an interesting story of a plot to to either capture or kill Winston Churchill. Yeah, which is not based on fact; it was fiction. There was, was also totally a movie fiction. he did that started out looked like a, such a great 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 movie called Ice Station Zebra. And developed into something that I don't even know how to describe it uh, on the North Pole with with no no dual coming. It, looked, it was North Pole and nobody looked cold. Uh, so, <laughs> except, the, except the theaters playing it. Yeah, Rock Hudson and uh, I forget the British fellow's name. Uh, Steve, you you know that of course. But that was just it looked so good at the beginning when it started, and then just, I think you're talking about Patrick McGowan. Patrick McGowan, yes. Yeah, with Ernie Borgnine. Again, Jim Brown was in that yeah. movie, Tony Bill, Lloyd Nolan. Um good cast. After he made the greatest well, yeah, after he made The Great Escape, he did a film which I thought was interesting casting because after The Great Escape, you would think that he could get any actor he want. Now in nineteen sixty four he did a film called The Satan Bug. George Maharis. George Maharis, and I, you know, I, I like George Maharis, and he's good in the role. But I thought it was interesting because George Maharis didn't have much star power at that time. I know he had done the TV series Route sixty six. Yeah. That's probably why he was cast because he probably had a, a, a popularity. We from had Satan Bug at United Artists, and uh, you know, it was just one of those little movies. Not not a bad film. He also made a movie called Six Thirty Six Sixty Six Squadron or something like that. I think a uh, six thirty three six thirty three squadron was that 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 wasn't Sturgis was it? No, that wasn't Sturgis. It was Maharis though. Um, Stur- Sturgis made about forty, directed about forty movies. I mean, he did a lot. What was that movie, Stephen Arthur, with uh, Kirk Douglas and Anthony Quinn, a, a Boot Hill or something? That was an interesting film. You guys know what I mean with Kirk Douglas and uh, and Anthony Quinn. Well, Hello. That's, that's an interesting title. I'm looking through his filmography, and I'm not sure what title that is. Something with Boot Hill in the title, I think. There was the last train from Gun Hill. Gun Hill. There it is. Gun Hill Road in the Bronx. Yeah. <laughs> ah, Boston Kirk Road Douglas in the Bronx. Anthony Quinn. Very good. Very good. You know, guys, I have a, an up close and very personal story with Steve McQueen when we had the world premiere in Boston of uh, the Thomas Crown Affair. I will not get into it now. It's, I guess it's a bit of a teaser, but I won't. I just won't do that. But uh, I really had quite a uh, uh, couple of days with him and his wife. A uh, very lovely person. But Steve was a. He was kind of like a moody guy. Uh, but he was a movie star. Uh, I I once asked Sturgis about what was his motivation to do the Great Escape, and on what was the theme of the Great Escape, and he told me a story. Uh, we didn't mention his war record. He worked on documentary films during World War II for the U.S. Army Air Force. He was stationed in Italy at one time and did a, a famous documentary at that time with some other filmmakers called Thunderbolt, all about a, uh, an American fighter squadron fighting out of Italy. And he, Sturgis said that he was at a crossroads one day 
And there were a number of German prisoners sitting on on the grass by the crossroads as these American convoys were moving back and forth. They were being guarded. And one of the Germans was reading an American comic book and seemed to be following it on. So Sergis Sergis seemed to think he might speak English. A general, a U.S. general approaches the crossroads and an MP basically said, you got to stay where you are while this convoy passes. And the general was very upset. And the sergeant started talking back to him and almost yelled at this general. Uh, Sturgis looked at the face of the German soldier looking. He was astonished. And he felt that part of the, the way that we won the war was the ability to be flexible and to do things, you know, to do things that were not traditional military things. And it, essentially, the Great Escape showed why we won the war which was because we did not just do, just give up and accept the, uh, you know, accept the same old, same old. We went for the big gusto. You know, we went for as much as we could to change the course of the war, symbolized by the fact that this American sergeant is telling this journal, general to hold on to his water. And I think that it inspired um, Sturgis with The Great Escape because he said to me that The Great Escape shows why we won the war. And we would not give up against the Germans. The Allies would all would all do things that were beyond the call of duty. We won the war because we were the great. We put together the greatest force uh, in uh, the history of the world uh, under uh, FDR and Eisenhower and MacArthur, and uh, uh, put together a, a country that was just uh, destined to win that thing. And they and the, the, the public, everybody was involved with World War II. But we were just better. And uh, we we did it, and then along came the atomic bomb, and the rest was over. But I, but I, I just in concluding on Sturgis, I think that if you compare his action films, that he really was one of the great action film directors, one of the great casting directors, not casting directors literally, but a guy who really knew how to cast a movie, and it should belongs in the pantheon of great directors, along with Otto, Otto, terrific filmmaker who who really is underestimated in the power of some of his films. You ever hear of a guy named Richard Marquand? Yeah, sure. yeah I know who that is. Sure. He's, he's, See, Eye of the that. Needle. Eye of the Needle always makes me, for some reason, make, always made me think of, of The Eagle as Landed. I guess it was close to, to, to the word and the title. Totally different director. Um, Just I'm going to ask you guys a question to end our show. How old do you think Spencer Tracy was when he made Bad Day at Black Rock? 60. Okay. Well, he died in 1967. He must have been 70 at least by then, 73. So 50, I'm going to say, I'm going to agree with Arthur, around 60. And Mike, what do you think? Spencer Tracy's age? Probably 65. 54. Whoa. Oh, okay. Really? Really? Yeah. Well, if you've enjoyed today's program, which we hope you did, please keep listening to us and, and certainly subscribe. It's absolutely free. We're, we're on all the platforms now, thanks to our wonderful producer, Mike, and uh, Spotify, Apple, Amazon, whatever you choose. And then you, we also have presence now on Facebook and Instagram. And if you want to email us, we are emailable at Tales from Hollywoodland at gmail.com. Arthur, do you have a joke to end the show today? I don't. I, I, I don't know. I don't know off the top of my head, but uh, I think that uh, there's, there's always the, the, the joke of if people want to know how to never go broke, never be broke. You learn three words, and that's all you need. And those three words are stick them up. Anyhow, guys. <laughs> that's Take care, it. guys. Bye, Steve. Bye, Julian. Bye, Mike. Bye, everyone. The Epsilon 3 is a dream given form. It's a home away from home for three guys to watch a 90s sci-fi classic TV show. Three guys with microphones over 3,249 miles apart, all alone in the night. The year is 2262. The place, Babylon 5. The podcast, The Epsilon 3.
on the ESO Network. This has been a broadcast of the ESO Network. Be part of the crew and help support our shows by donating to our ESO Patreon or by shopping for the T Public Store, which can all be found at www.esonetwork.com. The ESO Network, your station for all things geek.